Okay, I think we're going to get started, everyone. So good afternoon. Thank you for joining us uh, for your lunch hour at uh, 12 noon today. My name is Adrian Esposito. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens Campaign for the Environment. I'm joined by my with my colleague and co-host, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Tai. I'm President of the New York League of Conservation Voters and the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. And we are delighted to be able to present this uh, Zoom educational forum to everybody today. Just going to quickly tell you who our speakers are. And we're excited to have so many uh, of our regular, actually all of our regulators here who can talk to you about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. Uh, we will hear from today Dr. David Diamond, who is the Deputy Chief for Atlantic Operations uh, of the Office of Renewable Energy Programs for BOEM. And BOEM, for those of you who don't know, is the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management. We also will be hearing from Gregory Lampman. Greg is the Director of Offshore Wind with NYSERDA. And NYSERDA, for those of you who don't know, is the New York State uh, Energy Research and Development Agency. And last but absolutely not least are our colleagues at the New York State DEC. We have Karen Guidas, uh, who's the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Energy Project Management at DEC. And she's joined with uh, Cassandra Bayer, who's the Bureau Chief of Marine Habitat. So we really appreciate uh, everyone coming and attending. And before we get to our guest speakers, we want to talk to you about uh, why we're doing this. Why are we making this monumental transition in our energy infrastructure here in New York State? The title of uh, this program is Why Wind Works. Next slide. And just as a quick reminder, uh, we are in a tremendous uh, time in the period of history for the globe. And we are actually changing the temperature of our globe. And the United Nations, once again, this has been almost every year for several years, uh, released another report in 2023 stating clearly that human activities through emissions of greenhouse gases have unequivocally caused global warming. And that means that we, our actions are causing it and our actions need to repair it. Next. Uh, I just like to everyone to know the statistics because sometimes I hear questions which are great to hear about the cost of wind and the cost of transitioning. But as we do that uh, and answer those questions, we need to keep in mind the cost of not transitioning and, and con continuing to stay on fossil fuels. According to NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmosphe Atmospheric Administration, just this year, between January and August, the country experienced 23 groundbreaking and record-breaking uh, disasters that contributed to 253 deaths. And each, each incident exceeded $1 billion uh, with an economic total cost just in the first eight months of this year of almost $58 billion. Next. So the cost of doing nothing uh, is also very critical. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Wildfires is another uh, big issue. So it's not only the economic cost, but is the uh, cost to our health. You all saw the orange skies. Uh, it looked apocalyptic, but it also is ex the fine particulate matter contained in that smoke and that air is a very serious health impact, not only for people who are sensitive and have respiratory ailments, but for even healthy people. The fine particulate matter makes puncture marks in your uh, uh, lungs and respiratory system that cannot be repaired. Next. Sometimes people ask about what will the price of, elect of wind do to electric rates? And I think it's important just to keep in mind, this is the price of electric uh, from 1990 to 2022 without wind. And this is what happens when we stay addicted to fossil fuels. As you can see, the cost of electric has doubled in this time frame, And then from 2022 to this year, it increased another 120%. So the cost of electricity is on a rapid incline with staying addicted to fossil fuels. Next. 
keep going. <laughs> so I think stating the obvious, uh, we need to transition how we how we uh, get our energy. And the state of New York really has had big leadership when it comes to this. You know, in 2019, the state of New York adopted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is the most uh, ambitious climate change law in the country. Um, it requires that we receive 20, uh, sorry, 70% of our energy from renewable energy sources by 2030, and for us to have carbon-free electricity by 2040. Um, by way of comparison, we have roughly 27 to 29% of our power right now comes from renewable energy. Uh, so we have a ways to go to get to uh, emissions-free energy, um, but we are making progress. Um, we have to do this not just for uh, for the energy sector, but we ultimately need to do this for the entire economy. Uh, obviously, today we're focusing on wind. There is also a, a requirement in the law that we get to 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035, since that is going to play a big role in how we're able to transition uh, into renewable energy. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Look, we're talking about wind energy. This is not a new technology. Um, it's just where it's coming from. Basically, where you're harnessing the energy that's in the air from the the changes in the the <laughs> dynamics of the air, um, attaching it to uh, you know connect collecting it with a wind turbine, a blade that goes is connected to a rotor, which turns uh, a generator, creating electrical energy. Um, we are not engineers; some of the other folks might be, but um, it is something that is people can really readily understand. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, I think what's really important is that offshore wind power is not new, right? The first offshore wind project in the world was done in Denmark, and it was erected in 1991, uh, and it was in in uh, commission and uh, decommissioned in 2017, having been used for 25 years. So this is not a new technology. It's new to New York. It's new to the U.S., but it's not new to the world. Next slide. And with that, we think it's interesting for people to note that Europe currently is using 28,000 megawatts uh, of offshore wind power. Next slide. China, not known for their forward thinking environmental, pro-environmental policies, is using 27,000 megawatts of offshore wind for their energy grid. And that might make you wonder how much do you think the United States is using? So you can put your you can put your uh, your answers in the chat. But um, I'll tell you. Next slide. Forty two. There we are. Not really leading the nation in the development of re of uh, this type of renewable resource, but we have one particular offshore wind project. Next slide off of Block Island. These are just five turbines. They supply the electricity for Block Island there. They were used to substitute a, a three different diesel power plants that existed on Block Island that were old, very dirty, very noisy, very expensive and breaking down. And the state decided to substitute It's actually a rather large success story. Keep going. So we have here in New York uh, a whole bunch of projects that are in process. Um, Boehm uh, leases some some land out in the ocean. And in New York, we're lucky enough that we have uh, a number of projects that have been selected to bring renewable energy into our state. Uh, we wanted to show folks where they're located. It is quite far from land. Uh, none of them are terribly close to uh, close to shore. So that's something that I think uh, a lot of people have questions about very often. Um, we can go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, we have the first project is actually uh, under construction. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, South Fork Wind is New York's first power project for offshore wind. Uh, it broke ground in February of 2022. It's presently under construction. The, the picture you see on the left 
is actually the first turbine that is in the water uh, for that project. And it's very exciting. Uh, we're expecting that they're gonna start powering, uh, bringing power to shore sometime in December. Um, so it's truly exciting. It's gonna be 12 turbines cost uh, about 30 miles east of Montauk. Uh, and there's a cable that's been built in East Hampton via Wayne Scott uh, that has already been constructed and there's a substation out in the ocean. So which is why we know we're gonna get power from this turbine very, very soon. Um, it's truly, truly a, a great step forward, but that's just the beginning. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Right, we have uh, five projects that are in various stages of permitting uh, that have contracts with, with the state, um, which have, uh, you know, they're all those places on the maps. Empire Wind 1 and Empire Wind 2 uh, and Beacon Wind are three projects uh, that have been approved uh, or that are going through permitting processes. And actually Empire Wind 1 recently got, uh, got some approvals from BOEM uh, and they will generate you know, millions of houses worth of energy, uh, thereby Equinor. Uh, then South Fork and Sunrise Wind are by a company called Orsted. Again, they're going through their uh, their permitting processes for the other projects, um, but it's going to really uh, power hundreds and thousands of homes. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, very recently, the governor and NYSERDA announced three new projects, Attentive Energy, Community Offshore Wind, and Excelsior Wind. Um, all of these projects combined are going to have New York getting more than 8,000 megawatts of power from renewable energy. So these are from some new companies. We're going to learn more about them later on. Um, but Attentive Energy is a, a combination of a company called Total uh, and uh, Rise Light and Power. Community Offshore Wind is a company called RWE and uh, National Grid Ventures. And Excelsior Wind is being developed by Vineyard Offshore Wind. So we're very excited about all these. Uh, but again, these are going to power more than 2 million more homes are going to be powered from uh, offshore wind because of the projects that the governor announced earlier this fall. So it's it's really an exciting time. New York truly is a leader so that we can move off of uh, you know where we've seen um, very low amounts of renewable energy or of offshore wind energy in the United States compared to Europe and even to China. But we're, we're making a big step forward uh, on this. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. And so with that, we want to get to our presenters who have more details and can talk a little bit about the roles that the various agencies play, um, because this is not something that's just driven by developers. It's something that is highly regulated uh, by state and federal regulators. Uh, they take into consideration a lot of impacts people have, have raised with us. Um, and so I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. David Diamond from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Julie, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone this afternoon. Um, um, uh, and I, uh, I um, you think this is really timely since, uh, as you mentioned, we uh, Boom did have a major announcement for the Empire Wind Project last uh, uh, last week on November twenty first. We announced our uh, record of decision under the National Environmental Protection Act, which indicates our are in our intention to approve the Empire construction oper operation plan. So that's a that's a very significant milestone. Um, so I've I've got a few slides I'll present here. Let me go ahead and um, share my presentation. See if this still works as it did when we went through it a few minutes ago. Um, okay. Yeah. So so um, so I'm I'm the Deputy Chief for Atlantic Operations and Bohm's Office of Re Office of Renewable Energy Programs, and even though um, um, I I focus on the Atlantic, which is where most of our um, permitting construction activities are are uh, are occurring now, I'll I'll try to uh, also give a kind of a picture of our of our national um, renewable energy program in the outer continental shelf, and then um, talk about our permitting processes. Um, and and then show some just uh, an overview of some of the activities we have both nationwide and then in the uh, in the in the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf. So, um, Professor, just give kind of an overview of BOEM's mission and goals with respect to renewable energy. Um, um, uh, um, 
BOOM is a relatively small bureau within the Department of the Interior, but we have responsibility for managing over 2.5 billion acres of the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf, uh, which is federal waters generally extending from um, uh, th uh, three miles offshore um, in the U.S. exclusive economic zone, um, out, out to about uh, 200 miles offshore. And our, our mission is to develop energy and mineral resources in the Outer Continental Shelf. Um, uh, that's traditionally been oil, gas, and um, sand and and um, non-energy minerals, but we've uh, um, but we we do have a tremendous amount of ac of activity um, in renewable energy, particularly wind energy, and um, a lot of that's been focused by the administration's goals. And specifically, it started with a, an executive order calling for Department of the Interior to identify. Um, ways to increase renewable energy development, um, both onshore and offshore in public lands. And then our specific goals for renewable energy, which is 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, and uh, 15 gigawatts of floating offshore wind, which is a technology uh, applicable to deeper waters by 2035. So, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned, our um, uh, BOEM's um, energy development responsibilities is just it's traditionally focused on um, conventional um, energy and energy and minerals, but we we received authority to do renewable energy under the Energy Policy Act of of 2005, and our, our programs expanded very dramatically since then, and particularly just in the last um, uh, three three years of the administration, in order to meet those the 20 by the uh, 30 by 30 and 15 by 2035 goals that I mentioned, and uh, so that these pictures here also show. The four regions of the OCS that we operate in, the Atlantic, Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, and, and Alaska regions. And we, we actually do have renewable energy leases in three of those four regions. Um, we, we have leases in the Pacific. Um, we, we just had a lease sale in uh, this summer in the Gulf of Mexico, and we have one renewable energy lease. And we, we have most of our activity in the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf. So, um, so I'll... I'll do, talk a little bit about our permitting process and the steps we go through from leasing to permitting to con construction and, and, and operations. But, but something um, uh, I, I want to provide for context is that is that um, even though BOEM has kind of the, the lead agency responsibility uh, for permitting for most projects, um, it's really a partnership with our other federal agencies because we, we do permitting um, uh, under our authorities kind of contingent or uh, um, on on permitting processes by a number of federal partner agencies, including uh, um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, and and uh, uh, other agencies, as well as working very closely with state agencies and tribal nations at all steps of the planning and the permitting process. And it's really a partnership because all the pieces have to come together, both offshore and onshore. Um, to to be able to get one of these projects to completion. Um, so with 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 that context, um, I'll talk about BOEM's responsibility in processes. It's really four kind of distinct processes: the planning and analysis processes leading up to our um, renewable energy leasing, then uh, the site assessment that occurs after a lease is issued, and then the permitting, then the construction. And uh, at that point, there's operations, which can last for up to thirty years, and decommissioning, and those. Those um, those uh, fifth and sixth steps in the process, operation and decommissioning, is where we kind of hand off responsibility to our sister agency, the Bureau of uh, Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Although they are one of our our cooperating partners at at all steps of the process. Um, to 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 talk a, a little bit more specific about BOEM's processes. Um, so you you see the planning and analysis process starts uh, several years before we actually hold a lease sale and offer wind energy leases. And we, we identify areas, we go through a very rigorous um, consultation and analysis process to kind of balance all stakeholder and competing ocean user needs to try to uh, determine what areas to offer for lease. This usually lead, leads up to, to holding, a, a, holding a lease sale, um, which is a competitive auction. And once leases are awarded after that sale, then um, the lessee will develop a, a site assessment plan, which usually takes about a year. We'll review and um, and um, uh, review, and if we approve that plan, that'll provide authorization to conduct site assessment activities, which may last up to about up to about five years, and leads to the development of a actual construction operations plan um, for the project. And 
once that's submitted to BOEM and we deem that that's complete, we'll, we'll, um, we'll enter into our uh, processes under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which leads to we'll issue a notice of intent to prepare an environmental impact statement. And there's a, a two-year legal window for all the NEPA analysis. And that's when a lot of the uh, other consultations with our, our federal, state, and local partners occur. There's a number of other consultation processes and legal processes that happen simultaneously leading up to our record of decision under NEPA um, and our ultimate approval of the construction operations plan. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we got to that record of decision for Empire Wind just last week after a, a several year NEPA process. So once we we issue the construction operations plan approval, then um, we, we kind of hand off uh, to uh, Safety and Environmental Enforcement um, Bureau and they'll, they'll, um, they'll re review and um, provide concurrence on the final design installation review reviews. And then at that point, um, contingent to subject to all the other permits from other federal agencies, the uh, developer will be able to actually begin construction. And then that leads to hopefully a 30 year or more lifespan and then eventual um, decommissioning at the end of the turbine's lifespan. So that's that's kind of an overview of our permitting process and just the, what it takes and the timing to actually get to construction and operations. Um, so the, the last couple of slides will just provide kind of a snapshot of where where we are now, both nationwide and with our our uh, projects in the in the Atlantic. So this is slides kind of an eyeful, but it just provides kind of a a real overview of all the different areas we have um, various stages of those processes, planning and leasing processes going on. And then kind of the order of magnitude of the number of projects we, we have under re review now. As you can see in the Atlantic, we've got um, uh, we've we've got um, 18 projects where construction operations plans have been submitted. We've we've got um, uh, we've we actually have 33 or well, the slide shows 33 as of uh, this last week it was actually 34. Um, one of the projects in um, our Kitty Hawk lease was was split into two separate leases. So 34 leases issued. Um, we have active leases in the in the um, the three regions that I mentioned, Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf of Mexico. And we have uh, four other potential lease sales um, that we're considering for 2024, uh, a sale on the Central Atlantic, a sale in our Gulf of Mexico, second sale in our Gulf of Mexico region. Um, a sale in the, the Gulf of Maine, and also a sale off the coast of Oregon in the Pacific region. So lots of activities going on right now. And we have, um, uh, of the 18 construction operations plans that have actually been submitted um, and deemed complete, we've, we've issued six records of decision already, and we have two, um, two wind farms that are, under, that are actually under construction, the South Fork wind farm that was mentioned before, as well as um, vineyard wind off the coast of Massachusetts. So very exciting time. And I'll, I'll, I'll just end by, by by showing a snapshot of the projects that we've, we actually have um, on what we call the FAST 41 dashboard. That's the Federal Permitting Infrastructure Steering Committee um, uh, dashboard, which uh, most offshore wind projects, um, once they reach the the um, once a construction operations plan's been submitted and deemed complete, they'll go on the dashboard, and that'll help with the interagency coordination of the permitting process. You can see all the projects we have here and the kind of order of magnitude of the the power that's going to be generated, and this shows where they are in the dashboard milestones. I, I will caveat the the two wind farms under construction, Vineyard and South Fork. We show a a kind of nominal two year construction period, but uh, those are those construction periods are going a little bit longer than that. Um, but but as I mentioned, it's an, ex, it's an exciting time and uh, we have a lot of activity and look forward to answering any questions later in the, the present, um, in the discussion period at, uh, for today's event. So thank you. And again, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, David, appreciate it. Um, our next speaker moving right along is with Nyserter. Uh, we have Greg Lampin, and Greg, um, as I mentioned, is Director of Offshore Wind Energy. So who better to talk to you about what New York State's doing on wind energy? And Greg, I just want to mention to you, we're getting lots of um, questions in the chat about the, is there a new cable route for Empire Wind 2? Uh, so if you could weave any information uh, into your presentation about that, 
I think that'd be helpful to our audience. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, everybody at WindWorks New York. Um, so Greg Lampman, I'm the Director of Offshore Wind at NYSERDA, and I think some of the some of the introduction material is going to cover some of what I have today, so I can skip over a few slides pretty quickly. Next slide, please. Just wanted to give a quick overview of New York's role in the offshore wind energy development sector, just kind of as Bohm has done on the federal side, talk a little bit about our portfolio, and I've pulled out a few select activities that we're engaging in uh, in the near term that you might be interested with in, as well as some next steps. Next slide, please. So first, as, as was suggested in the beginning, uh, all of our work in offshore wind energy development in New York is predicated on the New York State Climate Act that was passed in 2019. We are particularly focused on our 70% electricity from renewable energy by 2030 goal, and uh, specifically the nine gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 20, 2035. So we are working to keep all of our projects a pace of achieving those two goals in particular, but also thinking about the broader goals that go out to 100% zero emission electricity by 2040 and uh, the 2050 goal in uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Next slide, please. So for New York's role, um, NYSERDA plays a bit of a hub in the development of offshore wind energy, but we certainly don't do it alone. Um, so the we, NYSERDA works in a lot of facets of offshore wind, everything from supply chain development to uh, workforce development and environmental issues and related. Uh, but our main mechanism in supporting offshore wind is through purchasing long-term OREC contracts or offshore renewable energy certificates. And I'll talk a little bit more about what they are in just a moment. Um, but we have that buying power on behalf of the state to bring that renewable energy into the state and compensate developers for production of that electricity. We also undertake a lot of other activities, but many of them are done in concert with our sister agencies in New York, as well as our federal agencies. Um, so, for example, on energy policy and offshore wind strategy development, uh, NYSERDA does a lot of work on that, but we do that very closely with the Public Service Commission and the staff at uh, the Department of Public Service. Um, we also do that on the environmental side with groups like DEC and on the maritime side with groups like Department of State. And so there's a lot of integration and coordination of work in that space. We do a lot of work on transmission planning and transmission planning analysis. So New York does not have a state energy office and I sort of plays that role to some degree, but we do that again in close concert with our colleagues at Department of Public Service and the Public Service Commission, as well as the New York ISO who's responsible for the, for the bulk transmission grid and the energy markets in New York State. We work on supply chain and workforce development with, uh, with partners across the state, including Empire State Development. Um, you may not know that NYSERDA sponsors a lot of research related to the environmental implications of offshore wind. So we're coordinating the New York State uh, Cables Working Group to try to make sure that the cables can come, sh come to shore from offshore wind projects in a way that's responsible. But we also are sponsoring projects like seeding surf clams uh, to see if we can increase the population of surf clams to support the commercial fishing industry. We're also working on issues around spatial modeling of marine mammals and fisheries and passive acoustic monitoring for marine mammals. So trying to understand the implications of offshore wind on the things that we all find uh, dear, but uh, and figuring out how can we minimize or reduce those impacts or risks. Uh, stakeholder engagement, certainly all of the agencies on this slide are responsible for stakeholder engagement, but we do a good deal of that. A lot of it is coordination with technical stakeholders um, through our technical working groups. And then ultimately, uh, state and federal regulatory processes. Again, New York is not a regulator. We do not issue permits, but we do work to make sure that all of our projects are built in a way that's responsible, that satisfy the statutory requirements, um, but also think about how can we make that permitting process more efficient so that these projects can move along more quickly while still maintaining the uh, the oversight that they that they need on the environmental side. Next slide, please. So our authority to purchase renewable energy uh, certificates comes from the Public Service Commission. They issue orders that basically put the guidelines under which we can procure that offshore wind energy. To date, NYSERDA has lit issued three solicitations uh, on about a two-year cadence. Back in 2018 was our first, 2020 was our second, and the 2022 awards were recently announced. And today we'll be, we'll be releasing our fourth solicitation. Next slide, please. So we get a lot of questions about what exactly is an OREC. And so first I'll call your attention to the uh, the stack bar chart on the right, because uh, just it's this is a really uh, a, a real simplification of it, but I think it helps people understand what we're actually purchasing. 
So when you look at the index OREC strike price, that top bar, that is the price that a developer bids to the state to build the offshore wind project. We call it the strike price. It's the all-in price that it takes for them to construct and operate that project over the 25-year term. That strike price is, is paid for through three different revenue streams, the market capacity price and the market energy prices. These prices are provided to the developer, uh, the offshore wind energy developer, just as they're provided to any fossil fuel energy developer. So if you're generating electricity and selling it in the wholesale market on the grid, you receive a market capacity price and a market energy price. These change over time based on your time of day of generation, your seasonal time of generation, and the location in which you're injecting that energy in the grid. And it's the same market that all the fossil generators uh, participate in in New York. But on top of that, in order to get the price to build the offshore wind project, there's an, uh, an OREC price, and that's the piece that we're actually paying. What's nice about the OREC price is that as the capacity, if, if the capacity or energy market prices increase, the amount of payment for the OREC decreases. And if the amount of, if the cost associated, if the revenues generated through the energy prices or the capacity prices decrease, the OREC price goes up. What this provides basically is a stabilizing effect on your on your energy bills. So it helps stabilize those energy bills over the 25 years so they do not become volatile associated with global events like a war in Ukraine and our export of natural gas. So we sometimes describe these OREC prices as uh, the environmental benefits or the environmental attributes associated with the renewable energy that we're procuring. And we say that because renew production, uh, electricity production from fossil fuels creates the challenges that Adrian described in the beginning, climate change issues, which we all pay for through our insurance bills, or even infrastructure replacements from, from issues associated with flooding that, uh, that we pay for through our local, state, and federal taxes. Um, in addition, um, there's also issues associated with the emissions of SOX, NOx, or fine particulates, which can have health problems, and we pay for that through our health insurance, or perhaps through our uh, through asthma and children and related. So this incremental price that we're paying on top of what the fossil generator get is really used to offset that and to make the projects whole. But NYSERDA purchases those OREX uh, through a competitive procurement process, and then the utilities across the state are obligated to take to buy those OREX from NYSERDA at that value in relation to the energy use within their utility zone. So the cost of offshore wind is spread across the ratepayers of New York. Um, so that get that's, and that's the way that it's paid through your electric bills, not through your tax bills. And finally, again, the having a fixed year, a fixed 25 year term contract also helps with stabilization of electric bills over time. Next slide, please. So just a few provisions that we do in our contracts. So we are buying these contracts and we do not pay anything to developers until they actually start generating electrons, but we do include in the contracts a number of provisions. So our scoring criteria is set by the Public Service Commission at 70% based on price, 20% on economic benefits, and 10% on viability. But we can obligate the developers to do a number of things that we see as valuable to the state of New York. So just, and this is just a short list of some of them, but obviously we are encouraging economic benefits and in-state spending. This can be on using the workforce in New York, but it is also related to investments in supply chain. Um, we are de requiring developers in some cases to have a mesh ready design, which will allow us to integrate offshore wind energy sites to one another, which will help with reliability and deliverability into New York's grid. We spend a lot of time with our stakeholder groups through our technical working groups we call TWIGS. They're environmental and fishing and maritime and jobs and environmental justice. And our developers are obligated to coordinate and work with those groups as well. Uh, we obligate uh, labor agreements and labor peace agreements. Um, we require the submission and evaluate the bids in part based on environmental and fisheries mitigation plans and stakeholder engagement plans. We obligate the minimum purchase of U.S. iron and steel to support the development of that industry in the U.S. Uh, U.S. iron and steel is much cleaner than overseas iron and steel, and we value that, and we want to see that industry built in the U.S. Um, we require benefits to disadvantaged communities, including workforce training. Developers are obligated to commit $10,000 a megawatt to support monitoring of regional wildlife and commercial fisheries, or I'm sorry, um, key commercial fish stocks. The intent here is that a developer is doing a lot of investigation of their individual lease area, but there isn't a lot of work to integrate lease areas to one another. So it's thinking about the build out of multiple projects and can we understand ecosystem change or stability as it relates to that by encouraging and requiring this sort of investment. 
Um, we require transparency in environmental data, so sharing of that data so people can see what's actually going on and what's being collected. And then we also have things like lighting control obligations, fisheries compensation obligations, commercial fishing gear loss obligations, and a, and a host of other things uh, that are included in our contracts when you're selected by New York. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is uh, the projects that we currently have under contract or that we are or that we recently announced. But what you're looking at is uh, roughly uh, just between 20 and 25 percent of the state's electric load on these projects. So we are, you know, and a lot of people don't think about it in megawatts or gigawatts, but that's basically what it reflects is, is closing in on 25 percent of the state's electrical energy is embedded in these contracts. So it's a pretty appreciable investment. One of the questions that we got was, um, what's going on with Empire Wind 2 and the uh, and the cable fall into Long Island? And so just a little backstory here. So you probably are aware of the veto that the governor had for parkland alienation as it relates to that particular project. And the governor's reason for that was the fact that there was a lot of concern from uh, the local elected officials, uh, the state elected officials in particular, as it relates to that project and some locals within the community. And the governor's message was not one of anti-offshore wind, but really was one of requiring developers to spend time in those communities to gain the support or at least the acceptance of the, of the project coming and interacting with their communities. And so it was a message to developers, you need to double down on these efforts and work harder. And so that is not necessarily the end of that project. So Equinor, uh, Empire Wind 2 still has a contract with NYSERDA. They are still trying to think through how exactly they can have that project proceed. But it is really in Empire Wind 2's court right now to uh, to try to make that project work and find routes that will be acceptable to those local communities. Next slide, please. Uh, just to look at the future, we are planning. We're working on a master plan 2.0 for deeper water. So we're thinking beyond the lease areas that BOEM currently has available to us. But also a lot of our work now is, is based on work that we had done with our original master plan, which helps guide how do we interact with people and how do we reduce the risks and increase the opportunities associated with offshore wind? And this planning effort really goes to that. And you'll hear more about that uh, early next year. We'll be asking Boeing for additional lease area. And then late in the year, we expect to be releasing our final master plan, which will show a, a path which New York will advance into deeper water. Next slide, please. And just a bit of information for you. Um, so we have a Learning from the Experts webinar series, which has been really well received. These are experts in the space. We have more than 35 of them posted on our website. And uh, if you're interested in any particular topic about offshore wind, you can go there and listen to a one hour webinar from the experts on that topic. You can also submit requests for topical webinars that we can, uh, we can try to find experts to fulfill. Next slide, please. And one more. So we're gonna be, we have a biennial offshore wind state of the science workshop. We call it a workshop because there's a lot of meetings that take place leading up to and at that event. It is the largest offshore wind wildlife related conference on the planet. And we're gonna be hosting that next year on our next summer on Long Island. And uh, we look forward to bringing experts from around the world together to, uh, to leverage their knowledge and try to uh, advance offshore wind in a way that is responsible to the wildlife and, and, stake and um, other stakeholders in the space. Next slide, and I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. Next steps. So we are releasing our, our fourth solicitation today, a very busy day at NYSERDA. It's predicated on an RFI that we released uh, earlier in the month uh, or that closed earlier in the month. So you'll see more details about that later today. We're also planning on uh, having a series of open houses on Long Island and in New York City with our new developers and, uh, and our current developers and NYSERDA staff. So happy to have you all out to, uh, to talk to you about our work. Uh, and interact directly. And uh, and again, we're looking at making a request of new lease areas from BOEM uh, early next year. Thank you. Great. And uh, Greg, if you could always keep in contact, let us know when all those open houses are, and we will email out to all the folks who are on this uh, forum today, which we have almost 200. So it'll be a great way to get people the information about um, when and where these open houses are so they can ask questions in person if they would like to do so. Absolutely. Apologies on going long. Oh, no, that's okay. Okay, well, let's hear from our colleagues at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Karen? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to CCE and New York League of Conservation Voters for inviting DEC to participate in this virtual Lunch and Learn Forum. Next slide. 
Great. So this is the panel for today. So again, I'm Karen Guidis. I'm the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Energy Project Management in the Division of Environmental Permits. And um, joined with me today is Cassie Bauer. And Cassie is the Chief of the Bureau of Marine Habitat. Um, so within um, the Bureau of Energy Project Management, we um, manage DEC's review and approval of energy projects and ensure compliance with applicable environmental laws and regulations. Um, and then Cassie's Bureau works to monitor, protect, and restore coastal ecosystems, implement New York's Ocean Action Plan, and reviews permit applications for impacts to marine resources. And then beyond Cassie and myself, DEC has a team of professionals that work on the review of offshore wind projects, including technical staff and other divisions like water, fish and wildlife, and our Office of General Counsel. Next slide. So on the screen is DEC's mission, and the DEC offshore wind team fulfills this mission by identifying sensitive resources and environmental quality concerns and recommending ways to avoid and minimize environmental impacts during the siting of offshore wind transmission cables and port infrastructure projects. Next slide. So DEC staff are involved in many aspects of offshore wind planning and siting in both federal and New York state waters. So from the planning standpoint, um, DEC participates in a number of technical working groups, or also called TWIGs, with our partners at NYSERDA. NYSERDA established four offshore wind TWIGs to bring key stakeholder groups together with the offshore wind industry and state and federal regulatory agencies. And the TWIGs include fisheries, environmental, maritime, and jobs and supply chain. DEC also participates in several New York State interagency working groups, include the, including the cable working group that uh, Greg mentioned earlier, which developed the offshore wind cable corridor constraints assessment report. And this report was a result of the collaborative effort of multiple New York State agencies um, with the purpose of increasing the understanding of challenges and opportunities relevant to offshore wind development. The report identifies siting principles to guide the development and siting of transmission cables to avoid impacts to sensitive resources, among other principles. And finally, on this slide, DEC is involved in environmental reviews conducted pursuant to NEPA. Um, DEC participates as a NEPA co cooperating agency for projects that have a connected action in New York State. And DEC also works collaboratively with other New York State agencies to develop a one state voice comment letter to BOEM. Next slide. So this slide highlights ways that DEC is involved from a regulatory standpoint. So our principal role in the review and siting of offshore wind projects is through the regulatory process. Um, <clears throat> DEC reviews all project elements in New York State, both onshore and offshore, out to the three nautical mile limit. Project elements within New York State's jurisdictional purview include manufacturing, staging, and assembly areas, transmission cables, and points of interconnection, and operation and maintenance facilities. DEC ensures that all project activities are consistent with the Environmental Conservation Law, or ECL, and its implementing regulations. Next slide. So as far as the transmission cables, um, I'm going to walk through the main ways that DEC ensures that offshore wind transmission projects meet substantive requirements of applicable environmental laws and regulations. And we do this as a participant in the public service law Article 7 process. Article 7 is a section of the public service law that provides a single forum for reviewing the need for and the environmental impact of major transmission facilities. The process is overseen by the Public Service Commission, or PSC, and which is the appointed board in New York State government located within the Department of Public Service, or DPS. DPS is the lead New York State agency for Article 7 reviews for transmission facilities. However, DEC participates in the process as a statutory party. In other words, the public service law specifies that DEC is automatically a party along with sub several other New York State agencies. Pursuant to Article 7 of the public service law, DEC is statutorily preempted from issuing permits required by the environmental conservation law. DEC only retains permitting authority over federally delegated programs such as the State Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits or SPEEDIES. 
applicants or offshore wind developers must receive a certificate of environmental compatibility and public need or a certificate for short from the PSC prior to constructing a major transmission facility. The certificate includes conditions that are akin to the conditions that DEC would normally include in DEC's permits. Next slide. <clears throat> this flow chart outlines the main phases of the Article 7 process. While the detailed information is not easily read readable on this slide, the intent is to show the overall framework of the Article 7 reviews. And I'm just going to walk through how DEC participates in each of phases of the Article 7 review. So for the pre-application phase, DEC participates in pre-application meetings with developers. We identify sensitive resources and environmental issues of concern, and we may issue permits for survey activities if needed. A note that I said earlier that we're preempted generally, but that's that starts with the application of um, the Article 7 uh, application submission. So during the application phase, DEC reviews application materials and provides support to DPS staff and serves as technical experts for DEC's areas of expertise. Another phase that's not shown on this flowchart um, is the settlement phase. And settlement happens between the application phase and the hearing and decision phase. Um, during settlement, DEC works with the applicant and other parties to formulate a joint proposal, which outlines the applicable laws and regulations, as well as the impacts of the project with attached conditions that apply to project construction and operation. As I mentioned, this confidential settlement process begins after the application is submitted, and applicants and settlement parties meet regularly to negotiate proposed contents of the certificate. The hearing and decision phase is a phase in which DEC submits a brief in order to support the joint proposal that was developed during settlement. Um, it also is a phase where the Public Service Commission must ensure that projects comply with ap applicable laws and regulations, including the ECL and DEC regulations. And finally, the post-certificate phase. If the certificate is ultimately issued by the Public Service Commission, the detailed review for the offshore wind transmission line takes place during this post-certificate phase. DEC reviews erosion management and erosion, sorry, <laughs> erosion management and construction plans, uh, which include detailed project engineering drawings and plans. This may also include review of uh, net conservation benef benefit plans for TNE species, threatened and endangered species. And we also attend pre-construction meetings and remain on call for issues involving DEC's jurisdiction. Next slide. So the main issues of concern that DEC focuses on during the Article 7 review um, are outlined on this slide. Um, these are just some broad topics where we ensure that impacts are considered when citing offshore wind cables. Um, for water quality and sediment management, we ensure that the developer considers best management practices to ensure compliance with New York's water quality standards. For benthic resources, benthic habitats are the communities located on the seafloor and can be disturbed from survey activities, cable laying, installation of hard structure. Um, of course, fisheries is a concern that we uh, will participate in conversations on and we recommend that at least there's a six foot burial depth and minimizing the use of cable protection measures um, to decrease the hazards and risks from um, sn snagging fishing gear on cables. Protected species, um, EMF and, and the others listed here, are other um, areas where DEC focuses on when we participate in the Article 7 reviews. Next slide. So in addition to the siting of offshore wind cables, DEC staff are also involved in the review of onshore support facilities for offshore wind. And unlike the transmission projects reviewed under Article 7, DEC retains permitting authority over offshore wind projects that involve manufacturing, assembly, staging facilities, and operation and maintenance facilities within New York State. And for these offshore wind projects, environmental reviews are conducted under SEEKER and applications are reviewed under the Uniform Procedures Act. And the review of these permit applications involve coordination with federal and state partners. 
provided a project meets permit issuance standards, DEC issues permits for work associated with the development of these onshore facility support facilities for offshore wind. So this concludes DEC's overview of our role in the siting of offshore wind projects. And on the next slide, these are the contacts the, um, from the DEC's offshore wind team that you can follow up with if there's any questions. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. All right, so we have a, do have a couple minutes left and we have lots of questions coming in uh, to the Q&A section here. I'm gonna ask our panelists as we ask you these questions to please be succinct so we can get to the next question. Um, Greg is smiling. Okay, we're gonna start off with Michael Hansen's question. What percentage of electricity comes from fossil fuels in the US? Is the percentage decreasing with the increase of renewables? I guess that would be for you, um, David. Yeah, so um, I, I can't speak to the actual numbers. I mean, I'd, I'd have to look at like, like re, refer to kind of authoritative sources like Department of Energy, but um, I mean, I mean, right, 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 right now, from from an offshore wind perspective, we're really just at the beginning of the process. We have our our our, our first few wind farms under construction now. So even though it's a, uh, um, as was mentioned before, it's a very very small percentage of electricity provided by offshore wind, just the the Block Island project. I think we're 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 moving forward on our thirty by thirty goal. We've 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 leased areas sufficient to meet the um, to to provide over 30 gigawatts of power. So as as our permitting processes continue, we in in these these uh, farms are constructed and the power starts coming on shore, we, we think that's gonna that's gonna make a significant impact on uh, on on uh, the 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 power grid. So I, I think I'll just leave it at that. I do think it's important to note that here in New York downstate, 90% of the energy still comes from fossil fuels. So this is going to have, when we have offshore wind, will make a demonstrable difference in how much we rely on fossil fuels here in New York. Um, next, we have Nancy Anderson wants to know if recent uh, European or Chinese offshore wind projects avoided cancellation based on the rising cost of money materials, which have impacted um, or have been of concern here in New York. So I don't know if either, if any of you um, are yeah, familiar with that. I can take that one. Yeah. So we've we've had a lot of conversations with our European partners and there has been a a, a, a number of project cancellations. Um, the ones of note are particularly in the UK. UK has done an excellent job of bringing down offshore wind energy prices over time. And in their last auction, they did not receive any bids um, because no one could build for the projects, build the projects at the price that they were allowing. And the auction before that, they had selected a few projects which attrited not more than four or five months after selection. And so I think they're seeing the same issues in Europe as we are. I think the big difference is the Europeans are advancing offshore wind because they're very concerned with natural gas being cut off from Russia. And so they're advancing it in the fear of freezing in the winter more than just for the benefits of the uh, of the renewable energy. So they are very dedicated to advancing offshore wind uh, to offset natural gas. Great. Thank you. I did not know that, actually. So thank you. That was helpful. Um, we got a couple of questions here about decommissioning. So we're going to just combine them into one. Um, but people want to know, what is the process of a decommissioning? And why do you have to decommission them? Can't they be upgraded and then continue to operate? As people talk about decommissioning, let's get them built first. But but OK, uh, Greg or, or David, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, so so this is Dave. Uh, um, I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so so the uh, I mean the it, our regulatory and legal requirements are that we we do have to include consider the decommissioning costs and plan for decommission as part of the construction operations approval and and all of the permitting that that's required to begin building. Um, so there's a legal requirement for that and and. That's really normally to ensure that the ocean bottoms re return to condition it was in beforehand. That being said, I know there's there's a on the oil and gas side there's a precedent with the rig or rigs to reefs program where we've we've looked at other um, uh, benefits that accrue from keeping the turbines there. I mean the um, we we talk about a nominal thirty year lifespan, but those lifespans could go on. There there could be requests to to for activities that'll um, or or 
construction that'll that'll extend that lifespan. When it does get to decommissioning, I think at that point there's regulatory processes and there's there's provisions that would allow for examination of what that decommissioning looks like. Is it a true decommissioning down to the bare ocean bottom, or is there like a rigs to reefs type type provision that's that's allowed? But but it it it, it is it is legally required, so we we definitely do consider that up front. Thank you. Um, some folks have asked some questions about a uh, possibility of Great Lakes wind, and in particular, is that something that Boehm would regulate should someone choose to advance that? Is it Boehm or NYSERDA, they want to know? I think the question was I can, I can take this one. So we, we recently published a series of reports on uh, Great Lakes wind energy in New York. Um, and so Boehm does not have jurisdiction in the Great Lakes. The, the seabed in the Great Lakes is owned by the individual states uh, or Canada on the north side. Um, and so it would be up to the responsibility of the states. That does not mean that the federal government doesn't have a role. So the federal regulators, thinking about fish and wildlife, for example, would certainly have a role in the, in the permitting of those projects, but it wouldn't be the jurisdiction of Boehm. Okay. Uh, I want to go to Sarah's question. We get this question a lot here at CCE as well. Uh, for NYSERDA, can you select one cable corridor through Long Island Sound so that the sound is only disturbed once? Um, and rather than have multiple cables go through it. Yeah, so this is the objective of some of the work that's going on with the Cables Working Group, which is to understand what do we find valuable and how do we coordinate cables just like that. And I think what's going on that may not be absolutely obvious, but the, but the Public Service Commission issued orders and the ISO has followed with the Long Island PPTN. It's a public policy transmission needs process by which they've announced a project that will build transmission on Long Island to support some grid constraints there. But they've done a similar one for New York City, which is in development now. And the idea is to is to have a transmission developer build between 4,770 megawatts of transmission up to eight gigawatts of transmission through one developer. And in doing so, you really are providing that coordination that people are looking for. So they're going to be looking for bids into that process. But by the nature, the very nature of selecting one developer for all of that transmission, you will get coordination out of the process and a better outcome ultimately. Okay, and I just want to accent, we know of, uh, you know, you know, of the tremendous uh, concern and commitment that many groups have to restoration and preservation of Long Island Sound. So we just want to plant that seed once again in your ear, Greg. Absolutely. Um, I know we're at one o'clock, but maybe we can get one more question in. Um, we have a, a senator from Connecticut who has um, written a number of questions in particular related to noise thresholds. And they're wondering in particular, um, would, is there a possibility of setting a noise limit threshold for, uh, for construction uh, to protect um, underwater life? So I don't know, Boehm, maybe this is for you. <laughs> yeah, so 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 the, uh, so that's part of, um, I mean, we 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 do look very carefully at noise levels, and we coordinate closely with uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. Like they'll they'll issue permits, and under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, that that um, that will will specify the um, that as part of that permitting process, it'll specify noise levels for individual projects. And a lot of I mean, there's um, we we look to um, to like we we look kind of holistically at the best available science on on what kind of noise level should be set um but at the same time all that is done on a project specific basis and there's a pretty robust um requirements for monitoring and and um and, and of, of monitoring sound levels as construction is going on and that's specified in the in the the terms and conditions of our construction operations plan approval but there's a it's a, I mean, there, there, there is very robust analysis that goes into setting sound levels that um, can occur during the, during the pile driving during the construction phase. All right. And lastly, we're going to do one question for the DEC. Um, can you just really quickly mention a, a impacts on marine mammals and this false narrative about the dangers to whales specifically? So that's, for, uh, I guess, Karen or, and or Cassandra. Cassie, you want to take this one? Uh, sure, I can, you know, be brief with this, um, that there's 
there's really no evidence suggesting that there's um, that offshore wind activities are impacting or causing mortality to to whales. And you did have a previous webinar on this, so I suggest yes. if anyone has any further questions, that was a great webinar. There's a recording online to go to that, and one of our um, DEC. Uh, marine mammal um, biologist was on there presenting all of our information on that. So that's true. Anybody wants to see it, it's on our YouTube channel, Citizens Campaign for the Environment's YouTube channel. And I think it's gotten over a thousand views already as well. So it's pretty good. So we have to go now. Uh, your lunch period is over, but I want to really thank um, all of our participants here. We appreciate your time and your talents and sharing your expertise with us. We did have almost 200 people on this Zoom. And the goal here is for um, CCE and the League of Conservation Voters to provide public education in this monumental historical transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. There were a lot in the chat, but we did try our best. Julie? Um, we are going to be making this available on YouTube. Um, we will be providing a number of you asked questions about the presentations. Yes, that yes. is information we will be posting um, on the WindWorks New York website as well. And we will be holding additional uh, forums like this in the future. So be on the lookout for that. Um, if you have topics that you'd like us to, uh, to take up um, or you have questions about, please feel free to contact either League of Conservation Voters or, uh, or CCE. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.